Yeah, I think we've got it. Okay, uh, thank you for the very interesting. You don't get any bit of fiction because <laughs> it was all true. Um, <laughs> I didn't win the Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> there were no gaps in this city, otherwise, I would have written it. So, yes, Martin has given you a brief background on where I come from, and I, and I suppose that uh, I'm in the company of experts. I am not the technical expert on law or environment. I am. I'm a very dark, under the nails kind of person. As Martin said, I was an investigative journalist, a business journalist. I'm now a political economy uh, lecturer here at uh, SOAS, and I think I've carried on a few of those traits from my uh, past life as a journalist into the kind of work that I do. And I have to say that this is actually a part of um, a book chapter that, um, here. Here it is. It's called The Future of Coal in India. Uh, Rahul and Anurag are two researchers who work for Brookings India. So this is a very interesting uh, anthology, really, brought out by Brookings on, as you can see, the bumpy road ahead. Uh, most of the contributors in this book chapter are ex-bureaucrats. There is the um, ex-chairman of Coal India Limited, if some of you are aware of what Coal India is. It is the behemoth in the uh, mining industry in India. It's a public sector company. Some, some uh, uh, you know, senior personnel from thermal power plants really taking a look at the sort of more technical issues in terms of oh, you know, the technology for mining coal, uh, what it means for the power sector. They, they kind of invited me to come and give a sort of non-technical perspective as you know, wearing, wearing my ex-journalist uh, hat. And um, of course, they were cutting corners in, in a manner because there was no funding for primary research. All of this was desk-based research and based on, on uh, some of the travels that I've done in India. And they've been dated. The last time I visited a coal mine or an iron ore mine was about 15 years ago. But nothing much has changed in a lot of, in a, in a manner of speaking. A lot of interesting legislation has happened. But as we talk about in the chapter, the, in India, and indeed as in most developing countries, we have a huge implementation deficit. You know, the, the formal policy says something, the enforcement is something completely different. Uh, and uh, so, so that is something that we talked about here. And the idea is, now we, we know that uh, you know, mining is extremely disruptive. It's extremely disruptive to livelihoods, to uh, communities who reside there, uh, to the environment around, around the pithead. But given the fact that for whatever policy-induced reason, India's energy mix, and I'm sure all of you are aware of what the energy mix is, right? Everyone obviously knows what the energy mix is, great. Uh, you know, the energy mix in India is about to change around here. Uh, India's had some uh, very sort of, um, I wouldn't call it a hard constraint, but has some interesting commitments made, made uh, from, from Paris. And uh, the mix of RE to coal, the ratio has been slowly going up. Of course, uh, RE has gone up from a really, really tiny base and the growth is going to be much faster. But there are going to be some substitution effects. And what we tend to forget is while uh, the lives and livelihoods of those affected by mining is, is something that's been talked about, you'll find lots of articles, very excellent, very relevant articles by academics on mining affected communities. There is something to be said for what is going to happen to people whose livelihoods depend on mining. This is not about people whose lives are being disrupted by mining. That's a big part of the story. But there is equally the story of the lives of people who depend on mining. And there are, there are a lot. I'll, I'll give you a sense of the figure here, no figures here. Direct employment in the mining sector, 3 million. Indirect employment, 8 million. <coughs> Induced employment, I really cannot give you a clue because you have no idea where the chain of induced employment begins and ends. Directly, of course, people who work, work within the mines. Um, indirect, transportation, logistics, all kinds of services related to that. Induced is an, an well, it just takes me back to, to some of the work that I did around uh, some of the biggest, um, um, you know, political mobilizations and community mobilizations against land acquisition that took place in India. And I can, I can see from, a, you know, quick look around the room, most of you were um, sort of just in class, what, standard six, standard seven, when all these were taking place. But um, uh, land acquisition movements in the state of Odisha against a big uh, Korean uh, steel plant. It was, you know, yeah, well, we've got background music. That, that's even better to DSF. We're at SOAS. Indeed, we're at SOAS. One of the best, this is 
is why I never left <laughs> Martin. <laughs> Just grew roots Same here. here. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so coming, coming, coming back to that, I've visited a lot of mines in my time, coal mines as well as iron ore mines, and um, the one thing that tends not to get picked up is the fact that there are a lot of livelihoods that actually depend on mining around there, from from the tea, tea seller to uh, the guy who's, who's uh, you know, uh, selling, selling cheap household goods around there, a retail chain that's, you know, supply chain that's just built up around, around the mining uh, community there. It is a genuine community of another kind. It's not the indigenous community, but it is a community that depends on mining. And that is something that we wanted to look at in terms of what costs we are talking about and what compensation should be talked about. <laughs> I, I can see someone shaking his head, but I, 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 I'm hoping to drown that out. But it's not, it's not bad at all. It's, I think it's sort of South Asian from, from what I can make out. Um, well, but let's just check whether the windows are properly closed, because that would probably make It is a actually quite properly closed. She's got a really strong throat. Of are her you voice. sure that this is? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. That doesn't yeah. matter. Seriously. It's, it's, it's so through the walls, but that's absolutely, that's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. And the, the other point that I wanted to bring up, it's, yeah, we're used to it, this is so as, as you said, right? The other point that I wanted to bring up, when I say decolonize, I'm not really talking about the whole binary of the West versus, versus uh, or, the, or the global North versus the global South. Uh, a lot of the space in that decolonize, I think, in that decolonize conversation should actually take place between um, the state now and those who are affected. So what is the decolonize about that, that, that I am talking about here? Uh, and I have to say, much as I, I think it's an important player in, in the entire mining ecosystem and, and in the, the economics of India, indeed, Coal India is in part a big part of that decolonized effort. But more than Coal India right now, and I'm pretty sure all of you know what Coal India is about, more than Coal India, it's actually the entire network of private sector operators who have now taken up mining. And I'm somebody who who's a big believer in private sector participation. I used to be a business journalist. I don't, don't come, come here as a, as a Luddite or as a sort of card-carrying Marxist. Love though I call Marx, I come from Calcutta, as Martin, <laughs> Martin said, and that has a huge Marxist history. But the fact is, in, in sectors which are monopoly sectors, like mining, in sectors which require large opaque government contracts, the private sector has certainly taken roots and not always for, for the better. So. <clears throat> By the way, how many of you have watched this film back in the day called Kala Pathar? Anybody's heard of the film? No. Anyone? I've heard of the film. Oh, I, I, you know what? Okay, so have you heard of this director called Yash Chopra and you're wondering why I'm bringing in Hindi films? But this is South Asian society. Anybody's heard of the director Yash Chopra? Yeah. He's famous for putting his heroines in chiffon saris, right? But this was a film on coal mining before privatization. Incredible film, one of Amitabh Bachchan's best performances. Nobody's talked about it. If you find it on Netflix, watch it. Kalapathar was the sector before privatization. And then for all of the faults that Mrs. Gandhi brought with her, she nationalized the industry. And for whatever it is worth, Coal India was born out of that effort of nationalization. And we actually have an energy sector that's completely, completely self-sufficient now. So Coal India, remember, for whatever fault we lay at its doorstep, it's much better than the mix of really extractive private operators that there were in, in the coal mining uh, sector at that time. And of course, if you want to modern rendition of uh, uh, coal mining in India, who's seen Gangs of Wasipur? Okay. Again, must see. It's a modern mm -hmm. classic. It is an absolute modern classic. Both these films have to do with coal mining. And, and you know, um, so I also have a background in, in mass communication and filmmaking. So films is also part of the language that I, that I talk in. And uh, these are two of the best films that you will actually get to see on the social contract of mining. Do watch it. I highly, highly recommend it. So, Future of coal in India, despite India's RE, that's renewable energy commitments, coal will continue to be a key part of the energy mix. There's no running away from that. Despite all the optimism about, about renewable energy, despite all the policy com commitments, there is no running away from the fact that coal is, in, is going to stay important. I'm not going to say increasingly important, but it's certainly not going to go out of, of the sort of policy space as most people have been hoping it will. What does that mean? Which means that anybody who thought that this, this move to RE will actually mean we need less mitigating focus of the consequences of coal is going to be very, very disappointed. We actually need more, more policies of mitigating the effects of coal. But uh, the point that I make here is coal growth will happen 
as a result of okay, PLFs are, are plant load factors. It's a technical term that you use in electricity generation. It means how efficiently uh, a generation plant is actually producing electricity. They are actually at a fairly low point in India right now. They're bound to grow, which means coal demand is going to grow, but at a much slower rate. And that actually means that in a lot of sectors, because renewable energy is giving power produced from coal a run for its money, and this is important, coal is actually becoming far more mechanized, or coal mining, not coal, coal mining is becoming far more mechanized. Now, Coal India alone employs about 500,000 people. That says a lot for what that might mean in terms of the effects of coal mining becoming more and more uh, uh, capital intensive rather than labor intensive. You could almost think of it, for, for those of you who are aware of South Asia, you could almost think of Coal India as a sort of lesser twin of the Indian Railways. It is the largest employer in the world, the Indian Railways. Coal India doesn't come very far behind. And there's a huge political heft for the Indian state to be able to say, well, here is a champion. Uh, the, the, the company was listed on the Indian bourses about uh, seven or eight years ago. Here is a champion which is the darling of the stock markets, but it is also actually uh, providing a lot of employment to a lot of people across the country. But that is going to be under some kind of pressure, right? Here, here is, um, so this lecture, in this lecture what I try and present to you, as I said, is not something very technical, not something very theoretical, but a series of contradictions in terms of where we're going uh, with respect to the, to the energy mix. So the share of coal in terms of capacity is 60%, that's installed capacity, but actually when we generate electricity in India, the share of coal is 80%. That's a whopping amount, despite what people have been telling you about RE and the growth of RE in India. So that, about that for a while, however, and this government is extremely worried about, in certain cases, in these, in these sort of good governance issues, uh, how, how the rest of the world looks at it. And it is that there is a sort of hard constraint of the Paris commitment. And, and the Indian government actually runs, of course, subsidies for uh, setting up uh, RE projects. But it also has a policy of must run, which basically means that state governments or, or, or st basically state governments and distribution companies must pick up RE generated electricity from uh, renewable energy sources. So that's a policy of must run. So it's, it's pretty much a mandate by, this, by, uh, by the central government. So whether you like it or not, you have to pick up uh, uh, electricity generated through our resources. Now, this is something that I had actually uh, spoken about earlier. Coal India employs half a million people, the mining sector three million, eight million indirectly, and, <coughs> and a bit about uh, induced employment. But what is very, very interesting about this employment that is being generated, again, something that doesn't get picked up when we are talking about costs and compensations and livelihoods, is that these are in some of the most impoverished states of India. I'm talking Jharkhand, I'm talking Odisha, I'm talking Chhattisgarh, I'm talking Madhya Pradesh. Even West Bengal. West Bengal doesn't really do very well in terms of economic growth. So these, these figures are in some of the most impoverished states in the country. These figures add up to the number of non-farm employment in India, which is, which is extremely important. You are trying to look at an economy which needs to move away from farming employment simply because it's such low productivity. So let me just give you an example of what I mean by low productivity. Agriculture contributes just 15% to India's GDP. In terms of employment, it still contributes to about between 50 to 55%. Just, just the very ratio of it will tell you how unproductive agriculture is, and this is actually very Good or bad, I, I don't have a normative position here. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm putting up facts on the table. There are some interpretations to be made here. However, you want whatever standpoint you can, you can parse at it the through from, right? This is non-farm employment in some of the most precarious uh, states in the country. Let me give you uh, uh, some figures which I haven't put here. Uh, the average monthly salary of, for a miner who cuts or loads uh, in Jharkhand is about between 40 to 45,000 rupees. You can change it into pounds, it's divided by 91. The per capita income of Jharkhand is about 56,000 rupees. Now this is a state where about um, only 10.2% of the workforce is employed in the, in, in the formal sector. So this miner who has a job is actually lucky in the Indian context. And certainly in the Eastern Indian context, that's manna from heaven. So once we talk about, and I'm only saying this because we hear a lot about the disruption that mining causes, and a lot of, lot of the mining community, especially the miners, come from indigenous communities around the mines, and, but it, it is also a kind of, uh, 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 not a kind, it is, it is the only sort of solid employment opportunity around for mines over there. 
uh, forget the individual minor in terms of what it does to the state, coal accounts for 65 to 90 percent of the royalty of these Indian states. And these states are not known for their manufacturing or for their agricultural uh, success. Mining is important to these states. I, I did touch upon the political economy of Coal India, which is it is this huge uh, Indian government-run behemoth. It has, uh, um, at one point of time, of course, who you gave coal contracts to was extremely important. And we know that uh, it's not the last government anymore. This was the UPA government. In, when, when was the last election? 2014, when the UPA government was voted out of power. It cost the UPA government coal, coal allotment scams, as they called it. For some reason, they called it the Colgate scandal. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, it, <laughs> there have been worse scandals since then, but anyway, it, was, it cost that government its job. And, uh, but a lot of that was funneled and channeled through Coal India Limited. So Coal India has a very important role to play in the macro and micro-political economy of, of uh, sort of the Indian, Indian political settlement. And of course, at, at the local level, and this is something that I've seen in Jharkhand and Odisha very, very clearly in my uh, sort of work as a journalist, is this is an in, a very, very important part of local electoral politics. How you are going to upend that balance is something that uh, I don't think our policymakers have, have, have grappled with if you're going to start shutting down mines. It is an intense source of election financing across these, these Indian states. And that's what makes it so difficult to shut down. So it's not just about the livelihoods. There's also a, a hard political constraint that we are talking about. And I'm an economist. So at, at, a, at the very basic level, something called something that in economics we call structural transformation. Exactly as I said, agriculture in India is very low productivity. You need to move an economy from a low productivity space to a high productivity space, very simply. And that's called structural transformation. You change the structure of the economy. No economy in the world has managed to process a structural transformation, unfortunately, without having recourse to coal. And this is just a small statistic. This is not industrial, this is commercial use, right? At the same level of per capita income, China's commercial space, the air conditioning, uh, and these are proper figures, uh, you know, in the chapter when it comes out, I have references to all of this, was just was 26%. In India, at the same level of per capita development, it's just 7%, 7 and it is likely to grow. Now, whether that comes from new coal or, or existing plants is a different matter. That will have an effect on, on uh, more mining employment. But this is about the fact that coal is here to stay. All those uh, fancy reports and, and optimistic reports that say that India's energy mix is changing drastically ain't happening. There is just absolutely, there has been no example. And I'm giving you a small example. Yes? No, what do you mean by a space being air conditioned? And how does that count as an indicator for the kind of, you know, uh, what you're really talking about economic growth? Because in China's case, it's like, you know, multinational capital coming. So, and then you might actually get a number where, you know, you might say, you know, the commercial space is 26% kind of air conditioned. Hmm. But uh, in Indian case, uh, the multinational kind of capital might come up, especially in the coal and other sectors, how does it really come? I mean, I'm just trying to understand. No, but this has nothing to do with, this is about organic growth for, of demand for electricity. You build malls, you build residential houses, you build office spaces, you need to air condition them. There has to be a demand which will only come from uh, uh, you know, generating electricity through coal and fossil fuels. At the level of per, per capita income that India is now, back in the day when China had the same uh, per capita income of $2,000, China had 26% of uh, here. 26% uh, of Chinese commercial uh, uh, space was air conditioned. In India, it's just 7%. So this is an indicator of how there is room for so much demand of fossil fuel. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's not got to do with multinational investment, but this is about the room to grow. This is the demand pull of fossil fuel. So I, I'm putting up a figure for commercial space because we didn't find anything for manufacturing. Nobody's done that kind of computing. But if you, look at, if you want to look at China again, their growth has been driven by coal. This country where the Industrial Revolution began, this is where it is, it began with coal. That's, did you, is that clear now? Great. Okay, yeah, do, do stop me if you, if you have a point, if, if there's something confusing, etc. So why, why are some of India's commitments here uh, slightly untenable? And there is, there is, mind you, a difference between uh, renewable energy and electricity. Energy and electricity are not the same thing, and that's extremely important to understand if you're doing anything energy-related. Electricity is literally electricity generation, so what your power plants are producing. Energy is your heating in the house, 
what fires a cement plant, what your cars are using. So somebody says renewable electricity and renewable energy, it's not the same. That's a very important thing to keep in mind, okay? But all said and done, Germany is at probably 25 times the level of India's per capita income. It only reached 30% of renewable energy consumption in 2015. India is wanting to do that at a level of a lower middle income country by 2030, 40% of electricity. That's, that's really something that looks very good when you put it on paper, but how you achieve it, I honestly don't know what the policy levers are. The political economy is so complex and, and really, I, 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 am, uh, I am pretty much uh, at a loss for words. But there is another very interesting thing. If we are talking about a shift to RE, and some of it will happen, employment is going to drop off, the fact is most of the, the employment that comes from coal mining is in situ. There's no migratory labor. There are, these are communities who live around there, they are employed around there in the states where, where coal is found. All the renewable energy jobs are in states that are investing in renewable energy, which are on the other side, which is Tamil Nadu, which is the south, Gujarat, which is the west. There is very, very little scope for labor to migrate from these states, which are you know, the eastern, eastern frontier of India. And bear in mind another thing. For whatever the problems of the sector, this sector is an extremely, in terms of the demand for employment, it's a very low-skilled sector. Right? Whereas RE employment requires a fairly high levels, level of skills. And even in terms of employment generation, the RE sector doesn't exactly generate a lot of employment, simply because of the capital intensity. Uh, uh, nature, capital intensive nature of this. So, so mapping this on in terms of you can, you know, some some of this can be absorbed by RE is also not going to happen. And I'm really looking at a 2030 year trajectory because that's what policymakers need to look at. This is energy we are talking about, not something that changes in the next five years, but for which you need a 20 to 30 year policy horizon. And in that policy horizon, these kinds of changes are going to happen. So, so in the book, the one thing that we say is that if you need a collectivist social contract, and it's, it's an interesting a social contract, I don't mean it in the larger Rawlsian sense, sense, John Rawls, but as an organizing principle of consent and compensation. And both are extremely important in the mining sector, consent as well as compensation. You have two contradictory challenges. One, as I've said, and, and this is without a doubt extremely critical. You cannot deny the nature of this, of, of, of this challenge that we have, which is faced by mostly indigenous communities, and as it happens across the world, most of our, uh, well, most of the world's, I don't say our, most of the world's valuable fossil fuels are um, located in uh, areas which are populated by indigenous communities. So um, challenges faced by communities mostly indigenous and coal mining, water and air pollution, and land issues. Displacement is the most important issue. I'll spend a little time uh, on, on displacement when we talk uh, cost and compensation. And the upcoming challenge of employment loss due to a shift in areas. As I said, this is the two to three uh, decade uh, horizon that we are, we are talking about. And why? Because one is, of course, communities around the pithead have become much more sensitized. Some of you might be aware of uh, the anti-Vedanta uh, agitations in India. How many of you have heard of Niamgiri Hills, the agitation around Niamgiri Hills? Anybody? Okay, I've actually... Was that a hand up? Okay. I mean, I've heard a lot about the things that Vedanta has done, especially to the indigenous community, and you know they've been exploiting uh, a lot of that. So I've just heard about like in general. Okay, I've actually visited those areas, and uh, so, so bauxite mining is a completely different animal from coal mining. There's there's absolutely no two ways about it. It's far more polluting. It's far more poisonous. Uh, but they won a Supreme Court order at one level against, um, against Vedanta, which is a sort of darling mining company listed at the LSC. You know, Anil Agarwal, who's, who's the promoter. I can't even say Chathamas because you're recording all of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anil Agarwal, who's the promoter of Vedanta, is quite, quite a sort of uh, stock market darling. And, um, but this was one, one area where he actually lost out. And it was a sort of... Your lawyers. I don't even know whether I'll be, you know, pulled up for libel here. But the, the Supreme Court had actually a sort of broader view of development back in the day. The past was really another planet when I'm talking about about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, the Neongiri um, movement gave a shot in the arm to to protest movements by indigenous communities affected by mining mining in India. So you know, current policies and also, let's face it, for whatever it is worth in terms of electoral politics, it matters quite a lot how the indigenous community votes. So 
there has to be some kind of balancing policy for this population, not least because it's just fair, it's just the right thing to do. But on the other hand, as I've said, given a policy skewed towards RE, policies for compensating communities whose livelihoods depend on coal is going to be extremely important. How policymakers square up these two contradictions is going to be extremely important. So one aspect that I uh, just, just quickly want to look at is um, this element of intertemporality. And what do I mean by this uh, element of intertemporality? It, it essentially is the fact that if I'm a coal miner today, I, I, I give away my land, I get a fairly good compensation from Coal India, truth be told and to be fair, I, I get a fairly good uh, amount of compensation. I get lifetime employment as a government sector worker, which in a country like India, most, most of you might be knowing, is uh, it's the best kind of security that, it can, that you can hope for from a, from a certain, uh, from a certain uh, segment of society. You get, you get a good provident fund, but you also know that when you, when you walk down that coal shaft, you, you are exposing yourself to silicosis, which is one of the biggest issues that uh, afflicts uh, miners in the country today. Thankfully, accidents in coal mines have become less and less in India since Coal India took over. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about it, but it is not, not a, a career choice without its uh, consequences, right? So, so when I'm a miner today, and I, I generally have a sort of time horizon of 25 to 30 years as a miner, um, if silicosis doesn't get me before that, I agree to these negative consequences. And then 10 years later, if I'm, if I'm told that I am surplus to need, there has to be a compensatory element in the fact that I'm actually giving up all of this in the hope that I get a lifetime of secure employment, in the hope that I get a provident fund at the end, but my employment is actually being truncated. With me not being able to look for a job anywhere else because there's nothing else I can do. So this intertemporality of not knowing how many how many miners are going to be affected. Remember 500,000 uh, just in, 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 in uh, Coal India, and there are also a lot of private contractors in, in mining, and I'm, and I'm going to come, come to that. So that's one element of the compensation. The other is land acquisition. Now, till about five years ago, Coal India used to compensate, uh, uh, you know, those whose lands they were acquiring by providing them jobs because it was easy. You don't really, in, in the kind of uh, uh, mining technology that India uses, which is still still fairly old and labor intensive, for very very political reasons, because it provided employment, you actually provided jobs to people who were losing their land. That has started coming down now. <coughs> Coal India is very, very uh, slowly but surely moving away from compensating people with, uh, with jobs within the company. So where does that leave people who are now losing land? And that's, uh, uh, that's something to be said. The other bit is, and this, this should come as no surprise for you, these, these are actually figures uh, from IIT Roorkee, which is the Indian Institute of Technology and presented to the Indian Parliament, the Lok Sabha. This is quite stunning that in the past 50 years, um, displacement due to development projects has been at 50 million, of which 2.55 million have been due to mining. Most of it, mind you, is not mining related, it's actually uh, dam, dam related, dam as in not dam them, but the, hydro, the dams for hydroelectricity and, and irrigation. But uh, that's a fairly whopping, whopping number, and this was presented to, to the Indian, Indian Parliament. And here is a very important uh, uh, fact that I just want to spend a little time on, which is how do you compute costs for land acquisition? How do you compute costs for displacement? Now, in standard economic theory, you have a lot of ways of doing it. You have net present value, you can do ways to pay, you can do shadow pricing. But what it actually does is it reduces things which have no market value, or, or rather, let me get, I won't say reduces, it sort of um, diminishes, diminishes concepts which actually have not been produced for the market, which are much more a product of who you are, your identity, a livelihood, and gives it market value. It's something that a very famous economist called um, uh, Karl Polanyi, anybody heard of Polanyi? Said it's creating a fictional commodity. It has nothing to do with the market, but you're actually making it you know, suitable for the capitalist economy and you're commoditizing it. How do I mean this? Let me see if this is it. Yeah, absolutely. Sacredness. In a lot of uh, studies around <coughs> mining affected communities, in, especially in terms of displacement, the idea of sacredness comes up. And really, it's a belief system that for a lot of us sitting around here is, is, is quite alien. That tree is sacred. 
for a, for, for a general capitalist society, that tree is a tree. That tree has wood, that tree has leaves, that tree has fruits. You can impute a cost to that. What is my cost for sacredness? And that sacredness is linked to my identity. How on earth do I even begin computing costs there? So this is the other element of cost and compensation that we wanted to talk about. How do we begin compensating or costing these elements? That, this is what I meant by creating a market for fictional things. No, I can't create a cost or therefore a value and therefore ascribe a value to this idea of sacredness. And this has happened with, you know, uh, with, with project after project, not just in coal, across in, in iron ore. It's not, it's not something that gets talked about. I would actually say, and I know Rupa, you work in iron ore, and uh, I used to work, uh, it, it, by the way, do you know that um, it's a bit of a segue, but um, there is this town in the southern state of India called Bellary. Anybody's heard of Bellary? Why? I used to be in Bangalore. Ah, so you know the Bellary brothers. Yeah. Okay, so these guys, owned iron ore mines, at one point of time the demand for iron ore from India to China was so high, they actually funded the elections and rise of, in, in the south of India of a particular political party which is currently in power. These mining, uh, this mining family, they were called the Bellary brothers because the mine was based in this town of Bellary. It, it was an incredible transformation which touched no lives. In that sense, mining, coal mining, if, it, if it's a battle between two bads, I've chosen my side. But you, you, you know uh, Bellary well enough. Have you been, been to Bellary? No, why would you? Nobody needs to be, why would anybody even think of going to Bellary if you, if you weren't involved with the sector? But it's just a segue as to the kind of um, uh, sort of insidious linkages mining has in, in developing countries, countries like India. And India is also not even a particularly resource-rich country. I do a lot of work in Africa and you can't even imagine what the linkages are. This is a tiny uh, bit of the economy still having these kind of outsized, uh, what we call in, in economics, externalities, right? So, how do you assign an economic valuation to, to firewood of a certain kind, soil, fertility of the soil? And um, the other bit that, that a lot of mining, uh, mining projects uh, use to compute costs is something called Net present value. Net, net present value is a very standard uh, stock and trade financial measure, which it is really, what is my money worth? The money that I have today, what is it going to be worth tomorrow? That's, that's really net present value and, and a lot of valuations of projects. And that works if I'm setting up uh, uh, an automobile plant. It doesn't work if I'm going to be computing costs like sacredness. It just simply does not work. Marginal costs don't work, net present value doesn't work. Because again, what you're doing is you're just basically valuing a lot of things on the basis of a capitalist market system, which is land. And that's it. It's the value of land and nothing more. But the associated value, the imputed cost, is not something that actually gets, um, gets sort of um, locked in into calculations. And, and one, one sort of uh, reason for writing this chapter was, is there a way to look at costs in another manner when you're computing costs and when you're computing compensation? Uh, and when you're talking about the social contract. What is the way to look at costs when somebody loses a part of his or her identity? And, uh, uh, you know, we know that these, these kind of projects are important for development and nobody's going to doubt that, but we, we kind of played around with this sort of thought experiment in, in the book for a lot of the same people who will say, but this is important, this is necessary for development. And if you say, yeah, absolutely, but your house is in the middle of the freeway that is going to be built. Can we please de demolish your house? Uh, we know what the answer is going to be for a lot of people in most cases. So there is, there is unfortunately, definitely a class divide playing here. And the bargaining power of those around mining communities is absolutely, uh, the indigenous mining, uh, indigenous community is, is at, its, at, its, at its smallest in in India in the current circumstance. Why? And this is something that I wanted to bring up. You, despite all this feeling about for finding the right kind of compensation and consent, the backbone of the Indian legal system actually doesn't allow for compensation for coal mining. And this is, this is, this is where it is, right? The Land Acquisition Act of 2013 makes very limited provision for taking the consent of displaced populations, but this does not apply to Coal India Limited and its subsidiaries, even today. So the very fact that we were writing this chapter meant that we were pushing against a door that's really fast shut, that something needs to be done. Because it's not mandatory. What Coal India does today is under some kind of public pressure and because it's a public sector company. But uh, 
Actually, the Indian legal system doesn't allow for it. For it. Was that your hand up? No, okay. sorry. The lady from Bangalore. Okay, no worries. No worries at all. I'm not from Bangalore, but I just studied. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sorry. Who, who's, who's lived in Bangalore sorry. for a bit. Fine, no worries at all. Uh, so the legal architecture itself isn't there. So how do you then make policy space in a, in a, in a situation where the legal architecture is not there? Who do you pressure? What are the, uh, are the policy levers you might have? And these are extremely difficult questions that haven't, aren't really considered when we are talking about cost and compensation because people aren't aware <coughs> of the actual legal structure in India compared when we're talking about all of this. And the other bit that comes in is even if you're talking about land being acquired, we all know that you know, ownership of property is a designation of a social relation. Ownership or not of property. Let me put it that way. What is, what is ownership of land? It's a property right. The more property rights you have in our kinds of contexts, the more power you have. And, in the, and particularly in the Indian context, those without access to property rights tend to be those from the marginalized castes. So even when you're talking about who you are bargaining with, Columbia is going to talk to the person who has the largest parcel of land. What does that do to the smallholder? And Indian agriculture is replete with smallholding farmers who have, who are actually just landless labor, laborers. How do you factor that in? That is because you're just looking at this parcel of land. Somebody's got six hectares of land, and somebody's got none. How is that person going to find a place at the table? That's, that's the other, uh, so, which is why I said that those not owning land are even more precariously placed, and they tend to be in the lower rounds of, uh, of India's uh, horrible caste order. But I also wanted to leave you with this. It was very interesting when I was doing my desk-based research that there were two reports on two similar kinds of uh, issues in Odisha. Now, Ongul, again, one of the most impoverished districts in the country. Ongul is genuinely poor. Ongul also has some of the most, uh, uh, has some of the largest mining investments in, in the entire country. It's got aluminium plants, it's got coal mines. Um, and a report by McKinsey actually said that there, were, there was a tremendous multiplier, a positive multiplier effect. It had a poverty alleviation effect, and poverty had actually gone down. And then the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change in 2010 actually called Ongul the most polluted, one of the most polluted districts in the country. Why? Because of polluted water from the coal mining operations. The same thing that McKinsey said had led to a multiplier effect was being picked up by this report. Uh, Terry. Terry is uh, somebody, I've forgotten the full form of it. Sorry, senior moment. Energy Research Institute, Tata Energy Research Institute? No. Anyway, it's a, it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, well reputed energy research institute. They did this study for, uh, I think they did this study for the Ministry of Environment. And it was, you just flipped the coin. And they said, well, this was one of the most sort of notionally poor districts because it was it was one of the most polluted districts that you would ever ever find uh, in the country. And this is the nature of the contradiction. This both are true, actually, both are true. And I have done a fair amount of traveling in in, in Odisha. It's uh, very close to uh, the city that I grew up in, and, and I did quite a lot of work in, which is Calcutta. You can just drive down. Yes, poverty levels have gone down. Yes, it's ridiculously uh, uh, polluted from, uh, from all the runoff from, from the coal mine. And what does not get computed into costs in most of these cases is the cost of water pollution. You do get, uh, some co you do get a lot of composition, mainly that's around land, but water is, is at least a lot more tangible, but water pollution, very, very few people uh, get compensated for water pollution. And again, very interesting fact, this, this, this whole uh, sort of issue is replete with contradictions. We all know that if you wash coal, then that coal being used in a power plant is clean coal, and the pollution that then you know is emitted is cleaner. Great, but that washing from coal is a death knell to the areas around. The groundwater gets depleted. The groundwater gets poisoned. So you you come and say that yeah yeah Pallavi is just telling us these things, but what do we do about them? Very honestly. Unless you see both sides of the coin, it's very difficult to know what to really do about that. I'm not a policy maker. If I had that kind of money, I'd be selling that consultancy, but I don't. I have absolutely no idea which is why I'm here, <laughs> so as, as Martin said. But, but the fact is, both, both these are truths and both these are not. But I, frankly, very, very personally speaking, I, 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 I veer towards the Terry part of the truth than the McKinsey part of the truth. There is absolutely no doubt about that.
There is absolutely no doubt in my mind, uh, my mind about that. And this is interesting, right? Studies estimate that 13% and 9% of the pollution from power plants in the states of NP and Odisha was from power generation meant to be consumed in other states. So there's a spatial consideration. In a, you know, in a federating union like India, does a Gujarat which pulls power from these, these places, or maybe not a Gujarat so much anymore, but a Tamil Nadu or an Andhra Pradesh, which pulls power from these places, what should the compensatory system look like in a federal union like India? Because Madhya Pradesh and Odisha didn't ask to be polluted in this manner. They don't have the capacity to, to use the electricity that's being produced. Somebody else is using it, right? So the way forward. Philippe told me 45 minutes. I think I'm getting on to about that, right? Um, you Thank you. You don't have to rush. Uh, I'll answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that sounds nice. Now, uh, utilization of the DMF. This was, an, this was actually a very, very interesting financing compensatory model that the Indian government had come up with. It's called the District Mineral Fund. It was, it was, you know, some of the funds that you were, the royalty that you were getting, states were getting from the coal mining activities, were going to be put in a trust. And uh, the, the local government body, which in India is called the Panchayati system, which is a local government system, was supposed to look after the running of the trust and identify beneficiaries. In theory, it's a great thing, and it's the first step that we've taken towards doing something for the local community with, uh, with <coughs> royalty money. But what is happening is it's being used in a fungible manner, which is in an interchangeable manner. Money from the DMF is going into other pet projects. It's going into things like Swachh Bharat. It's going into things like, uh, you know, there's a thing called Ujwal. You know what Ujwal is? Swachh Bharat is to build, build toilets, which, is, which definitely needs, needs, needs building. But it wasn't meant to come from the DMF. That's what I'm saying. Ujwal is this last mile electricity connection. So it's being used for these other sort of larger, more, more sort of ex uh, more popular programs, which definitely have very important beneficiary communities, but they were not, the DMF wasn't used for that purpose. There was a, there was a different pot in the budget for that. So the DMF, while a really good idea, is now being used for completely other things. It's just, just being used as a sort of little piggy bank for other kinds of projects and not, not for the intended beneficiaries and beneficiary communities. Um, India has a minus provident fund, mind you, but it also needs to do more on the provident fund. So maybe create a you know, specialized silicosis-related, health-related provident fund. And it does have an insurance scheme, but more needs to be done because silicosis is something that actually um, renders you incapable of doing anything once, once you've been afflicted with it. Much, much, much more needs to be done. Uh, and we, we tend not to, not to look at those, that aspect of, of, of coal mining in, in terms of the compensatory aspect. Some uh, interesting exp uh, experiments have happened in Canada, which is actually, uh, you know, is, is one of the leaders in terms of uh, how mining companies uh, uh, interact with indigenous communities. They're called the First Nation. The non-Inuit indigenous community in Canada is called the First Nation. And Suncor, which is, an, uh, I think it's a gas, uh, natural gas company, has actually provided equity stakes to members of the First Nation uh, community uh, wherever it's, be, it's, it's set up plants. That's, that's something uh, that can actually be uh, replicated in India if possible. Now here's the interesting thing. We don't tend to talk about trade unions in India. That, that sort of discourse has completely disappeared from the country. It's another matter, and I'm Chatham House or not, I'm just going to put it out there. It's quite something, while doing research for this is with how I came across it, it shocked me that the largest trade union body in, in the country, the Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh, is actually affiliated to the right-wing fascist RSS. The largest trade union in the country does not belong to the Communist Party of India, it belongs to the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. I, it genuinely shocked me, but well, here we go. Or it, it is one of the largest. I, I think it's the largest, but I'm not off the mark when I say it is one of the largest. The traditional communist parties have lost even that space out to, to the RSS, which uh, gives you an idea of how far the country's come and where the labor movements have gone. But however, the trade unions have played an extremely important role in negotiating just compensation. And to be again very fair to Coal India, Coal India has done its bit to get the trade unions on the table. Um, and yeah, and then I've, oh, the other bit that I've just that I just wanted to end with is, is this contradiction of the continued need and heightened need for indigenous communities affected by mining uh, to be compensated, and how you value uh, the compensation and how you compute the costs there. And the other, of course, is as the mix changes towards RE in the next 20 to 30 years, how is the community directly linked to mining for its livelihood? How is that going to be compensated? So I'm, I'm just going to 
end, end on that note of a happy contradiction, actually quite an unhappy contradiction. But um, thank you and happy to take questions that you might have. I think I can now receive my chair duties while standing. <laughs>